and which I did in, in collaboration with um, with uh, Neil Schoenever, Andrea Perez Sánchez, Samuel Guite, uh, Vivian Poulan, and Julian Lesgur. Okay, so let me start. So, well, as you know, uh, the recent years of observations have led to establish a concordance model in cosmology that we call uh, Lambda CDM, and whose main ingredients are dark energy and dark matter. And it also considers some small amounts of baryons, photons, and neutrinos. It also has uh, two implicit assumptions. One is that uh, gravity is correctly described by general relativity, and the other is uh, the cosmological principle, namely the fact that on large scales, the universe is statistically homogeneous and isotropic. So in its, simple, in its simplest form, this lambda CDM model is fully specified by only six parameters, which I'm writing down here. And with these only six parameters, it's able to provide an excellent fit to the anisotropies of the cosmic microwave background, that is the relic uh, radiation formed shortly after the Big Bang. But in addition to that, it also provides an excellent fit to many different observations, such as uh, the so-called baryon acoustic oscillations, the luminosity distance to supernova 1a, the abundance of light elements, such as helium or hydrogen, and also the distribution of large-scale structure in the universe. So this model has been uh, extremely successful. Uh, Guillermo... So, uh, so, uh, you don't see my slides passing? No. Just the oh, first slide oh. and is not uh, in uh, presentation mode. At ah, least, no, but I, I, I don't see the presentation mode. Oh, at least here I don't see it on full screen. Mm, but okay, sure. sorry for that. Let me uh, let me see. You don't see the screen, the slides passing. No, right? um, not sure if it is because uh, that's weird because. Is, I'm doing just what we were doing before, and it was working before. No, so. I'm not sure if it is because I'm... Uh, okay. Uh, can you try again? Yes. Sorry. Not sure if it is because I'm registering, but I don't think this... Eh, now, now it's, it's fine. Okay, now it's fine. fine. Oh, sorry. Now it's fine. Uh, uh, do, do you see Okay, the perfect, perfect. Okay, very good. Okay, okay, sorry for that. Thank you. Okay, very good. So I'll move on. So yeah, as I was saying, this model has been uh, extremely successful. However, it faces several challenges, and uh, maybe the most important one is the fact that it doesn't provide an explanation for the nature of uh, its main constituents, that is uh, dark matter and dark energy. In particular, it doesn't tell us whether these uh, substances are made of uh, particles or not, or a single or several species. It doesn't tell us anything about uh, their production mechanism or other properties, such as the lifetime or the mass. And uh, a second challenge has emerged in the recent years with the increase in precision in cosmological data, which has led to the appearance of uh, several experimental discrepancies in the determinations of some uh, parameters. So, for example, we have a mild uh, two to three sigma discrepancy in the determination of the so called S8 parameter, which is essentially measuring the growth of a structure. And we have a much more severe uh, tension in the determination of the current expansion rate of the universe, the Hubble constant. So in general, there are two possible explanations for these uh, discrepancies. The first is that we, it could be that just that they arise because we're missing some uh, systematical error in some of the experiments. This is definitely the less exotic explanation. But as we will see, there are many different experiments that actually see this tension. So it becomes difficult that a single systematic uh, will be able to account for all of them. And another possibility is that these anomalies arise simply because we are not interpreting data correctly. And assuming a, a new model beyond Lambda CDM could actually uh, explain these anomalies. So I like this possibility a lot because it could reveal uh, new properties about uh, the very mysterious dark sector that I was discussing before. But as we will see, it's very challenging to find a model that fits all the data as well as uh, Lambda CDM. So, okay, now let me briefly introduce the first uh, anomaly that I discussed, the SA tension. And this uh, mainly concerns uh, the weak lensing surveys. So what these uh, surveys measure essentially are the distorted images of galaxies due to the presence of large clumps of matter along the length of sight. So in this way, they are able to get an estimate of the um, distribution of large scale structure in the universe, which is encapsulated by this uh, parameter combination that we call SA. So here omega m denotes the total abundance of matter in the universe, 
and sigma 8 refers to the amplitude of matter fluctuations over a scale of 8 megaparsecs. So it turns out that the uh, direct determination of this uh, parameter by several weak lensing surveys is always two to three sigma values smaller than the one that is inferred by the Planck uh, satellite, assuming the lambda CDM model. So, well, this is all I have to say about the state tension, but I will come back at this at the end. And now let me move to describe the Hubble tension. So this now refers to the discrepancy in the determination of the Hubble constant between the value inferred by Planck, again, assuming the lambda CDM model, and the one that is directly measured by the SUS collaboration, which uses a cosmic distance ladder method. And in particular, it calibrates the distance to supernovas using Cepheid variables. So with the new results by the SUS collaboration that were published only some weeks ago, now this tension has reached the warning level of five sigma. However, these are not the only measurements that we have of the Hubble constant. We, we have nowadays many more, and here I'm just making a small selection. And from this, what we notice is that it's not just as simple as saying there might be systematics in Planck or in SUS. Because for example, if you consider uh, other CMB experiments different from Planck, such as ACT, the Atacama Cosmology Telescope, you also find values of the Hubble constant, which are small. And on the other hand, if you consider other local determinations of the Hubble constant different uh, from the one used by SUS, you always encounter something that is uh, higher than the one inferred by Planck. So the thing is that uh, cosmological tensions, and in particular the Hubble tension, have become a very hot topic in cosmology. And nowadays we have almost a paper per day on the archive uh, proposing different models to, to solve this tension. So there was a recent review paper that was uh, compiling all the proposed models that have been um, proposed until the moment. And this uh, reference had more than 1,000 references. However, from this review, it becomes uh, difficult to compare the success in uh, the relative success in resolving the tension because authors typically tend to use a different and incomplete compilations of data. So in order to illustrate that, here I'm showing a plot from this review paper, where, which shows the, the predictions in the Hubble constant for very different models. And here the pink band shows the, the, the value of the Hubble constant inferred by Planck, uh, assuming lambda CDM. And the blue band in also the, um, the value directly measured by the SUS collaboration. So essentially, this blue band is what all these models would like to reach in order to solve the tension. So for example, by looking at this uh, blue model, this one might uh, naively think that this uh, performs much better than this model in pink, but this is actually very misleading because if we look in detail at the different uh, combinations of data that each of these analyses is using, we see that they are very different. And in particular, this uh, analysis in blue is using a SUS prior, while this um, analysis in pink is not, which is known to produce, uh, to lead to very big differences in the result. So in order to solve this problem, in order to be able to get a, a fair ranking of the proposed models in the literature, uh, we have uh, taken a sample of some of the solutions that have been proposed in the literature. We have quantified the relative success of each by confronting all of them against the same uh, array of data and using certain metrics to, to quantify the success in the resolution. So in total, we have taken um, 18 uh, different models that have been proposed in the literature and we, we have a split in three categories. So on the one hand, we have uh, early models that, moni that modify the early universe. And among them, we have models that involve some sort of dark radiation or extra relativistic degrees of freedom, which we call delta NF. But we have also some more complicated models that to this extra dark radiation add some uh, interacting uh, with, with dark matter or self-interacting neutrinos or maybe neutrinos interacting with a scalar particle called the major. In this same category of early universe solutions, we have also considered models that don't involve dark radiation at all, such as primordial magnetic fields or time evolving electron mass, both in a flat and uh, a closed universe. We have also considered some models of early dark energy. These are um, essentially models that propose a scalar field that becomes dynamical in the very early universe. And we have also considered a model of early modified gravity, which is similar to the early dark energy models, but with adds a no minimal coupling to gravity. And this is actually a model 
which was uh, proposed by uh, some people in Bologna here, such as uh, Fabio Finelli or Matteo Braglia. And then we have also considered models that modify the late universe. So we have, for example, dark energy with a chevalier polas Klindler equation of a state. And we also have a model so which is called phenomenological emergent dark energy, which whose main motivation is that it doesn't add any extra free parameter with respect to lambda CDN. And finally, we also consider two types, two different scenarios of decaying dark matter. So these are all models that have been proposed in the literature. I don't have, unfortunately, the time to discuss all of them, but if some of you are curious, I could uh, say more details about them at the end. Okay, so this is all about the models. Now let me uh, describe the criteria that we have used in order to quantify the success in the resolution. So we have essentially selected three different criteria that try to address three different questions. So the first one is, are we able to get uh, high values of uh, the Hubble constant from a data combination D that doesn't include the SUS prior? So in practice, we use this uh, standard Gaussian tensor estimator where we compare the mean values of the posterior distribution of the uh, Hubble constant reconstructed from this analysis using the data combination D and the one directly measured by SUS. And well, of course, we divide by the error uh, added in quadrature. So in practice, many people use uh, the Hubble constant in order to quantify uh, this tension, but it has become clear recently that if you add the supernova data to the analysis, it's actually better to quantify the tension in terms of the intrinsic magnitude of the supernova, because this is actually the magnitude that is truly model independent and which is truly measured in a very direct way by the SUS collaboration. So in order for this uh, criteria to be satisfied, we demand this tension to, 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 to be smaller than three sigma. So a priori, this might look like a very uh, weak criteria because at the end of the day, three sigma can itself be considered a tension, but in practice, we do that because we'll see very few models are able to pass this uh, threshold. However, this uh, method has some caveats. The most important one of them is that it is extremely only valid for Gaussian posteriors. And most of the time, the posterior distributions are actually non-Gaussian. And second, and most important, is that it doesn't tell us anything about the quality of the field. So for these reasons, we, we also use uh, the criterion two, where we try to answer the question, are we able to get a good fit to all the data in a given model? So in this case, we compare, we compute the minimum chi-square for this data combination D, not including SUS, and we compare with the chi-square of the combined analysis, that is of the data analysis that also includes SUS. So the difference of these quantities, uh, well, and taking the square root is what is so-called the QD map tension, and essentially is telling us how a fit is degraded by the addition of uh, the SUS information. So in a similar way as the, for the Gaussian tension, we demand this uh, criteria to be smaller than three sigma. And the nice thing is that this is now better accounting for the non-Gaussianity of the posteriors, because now we are looking at the maximum of the likelihood at the minimum chi-square and not at the projected 1D uh, posterior distribution. Is still not perfect because, for example, this criteria is not accounting for the effects of overfitting. That is, it's not accounting for the fact that a model with an arbitrary large number of parameters could fit anything. So for this, we use the last and third criterion where we try to answer the question, is a certain model M favored over lambda CDN? So for that, we use the so-called CAIC information criterion, where we are just simply comparing the minimum chi-square of our extended model M with the minimum chi-square of lambda CDM to a data combination that has everything, also the, the SUS uh, information. But now the interesting thing is that this criterion is also adding a penalty factor that is taking into account the extra amount of free parameters that are introduced in our model M with respect to lambda CDM. And well, we just demand, so this, uh, a good fit will happen for large negative values of this quantity. And in particular, we demand uh, this to be smaller than uh, this quantity that just corresponds to weak preference according to the Jeffries scale. So uh, we like this method because it's very simple to use and it is completely independent on the prior edges as opposed to other uh, Bayesian uh, model comparison methods such as the Bayes factor. So, okay, these are all the three criteria that we use. And so now that I describe all the models that we have in our contest and all of the uh, criteria to quantify model success, I can describe all the steps in this uh, contest. So the first thing that we have done is to 
run a data analysis of all this model against uh, this uh, baseline combination of data. So we have included the uh, CMB data from Plan 2018, full polarization, temperature, and lensing. We have also included the BEO data from recent surveys, as well as uncalibrated supernova data from the Pantheon catalog and uh, the most recent SUS measurements. Then, as long as we get a negative delta AC, that is, as long as we get a good fit, uh, the model gives a good fit to the data, we say that model is going to the finalist if the second or third criteria are satisfied. And at the end, among all the finalists we gather, we give uh, medals, and in particular, we give uh, bronze, silver, or golden medals, depending if they have uh, satisfied one, two, or three criteria at the same time. So, okay, let me start showing uh, the results of the contest. So, okay, here I'm showing the predictions of the Hubble constant for all these different models. So on the left, I'm showing the prediction for the Hubble constant, while on the right, I'm showing the prediction for the intrinsic magnitude of supernova. So actually, uh, on the left, I'm showing the Hubble constant because we are using a data combination that doesn't include supernova data, plan plus BAO. While on the right, uh, it's better to, to show the tension in this quantity because we are actually including uh, uncalibrated supernova data. And in, in each case, I'm also showing the results when we include a prior from SUS. So I'm just, first, I want to first focus on the, um, on the results for the late universe models. And uh, what we see is that a priori, if we only consider Planck and Bio data, it seems that some of these models are, uh, could be good uh, candidates to solve this tension because they have a very good overlap with this gray band, with, sorry, not gray, this green band that is showing the, the measurement from SUS. However, once we add the supernova data, we see that these uh, late universe models are actually very restricted. And this is actually something that was already known in the literature, the fact that uh, combining video and supernova data strongly con constrain uh, late time solutions. So in order to illustrate that, I'm showing here this plot from a recent paper by statue, which shows the intrinsic magnitude of supernova using a two different determinations. So the red just comes from a cosmic distance ladder um, a determination from the SUS collaboration, while the black comes from the so-called inverse distance ladder, which is what I'm describing here. So essentially, the first thing you have to do is to use a BO data, and this BO data essentially constrains two angular scales. So one of these angular scales is giving us the ratio between the sound horizon, which is just the um, distance traveled by photons in the early universe and the angular diameter distance. So this means that if using bio data, if you have some information about the sound horizon, you can automatically obtain the angular diameter distance. And then once you have the angular diameter distance, you can directly obtain the luminosity distance to supernova because these two quantities have this very simple relation in uh, general relativity. And finally, once you have this luminosity distance, you can compare with the data, with uncalibrated data of supernova and obtain the intrinsic magnitude of supernova from the calibration constant. So it turns out that if you do this procedure for the sound horizon predicted by, predicted by Lambda CDM, which is around 147 inverse uh, megaparsec, it doesn't matter how you tweak the late uh, evolution of the universe, the is, this inverse distance ladder uh, determination will always uh, disagree with the one obtained uh, by SUS. So this actually explains why the late time solutions cannot work because by construction, they are not able to change the sound horizon. So to make these two determinations agree, what we need to do is to reduce the sound horizon. And for that, we need some uh, solution that change the early universe, such as the early dark energy that I was mentioning before or some exotic interactions among neutrinos. So now if we go and have a look at the uh, results for the early universe solution that involves some sort of dark radiation, we see that they perform uh, significantly mm -hmm. better, but they still remain uh, very cons uh, constrained. And this is, we've seen that this is mainly because of the impact of the high L uh, polarization data from Planck. And finally, we look, uh, have a look at the early universe solutions that don't involve any kind of dark radiation. We see that this is definitely the category of solution that is uh, working the best. So now that uh, we can start uh, using the criteria that I was mentioning before and start uh, giving medals. So we've seen that uh, there are two models that win a bronze medal because they satisfy only one criteria, which is the primordial magnetic field 
and a model of mixed uh, dark radiation, which has both uh, self-interacting and free streaming dark radiation. Then there are several models that win a silver medal because they satisfy two criteria. So we have two early dark energy models, the early modified gravity and the major neutrino interactions. Um, finally, we find that there are only one class of models which are able to satisfy the three criteria and therefore win a golden medal, which are the varying electron mass, either on a curved or on a, a flat universe. So, okay, a priori this looks uh, very nice. But the problem is that uh, we realize that unfortunately none of these successful models in explaining the Hubble tension are able to explain the SA tension, the other anomaly that I was discussing at the very beginning. So this can be seen from these um, triangle plots that show the predictions for SA for all these different uh, finalist models. And we see that none of them is able to give values which are smaller than the one inferred uh, in lambda CDM, this, this red contour. And in particular, none of them is getting a decent overlap with the uh, SA measurement measured by the weakness in surveys, which is what I'm showing with this uh, purple band. So a priori, this is a bit worrying because this could uh, give the impression that uh, if you add some less scale structure data in the analysis that we haven't considered in this paper, this could actually rule out the resolution of some of these uh, winners. So in practice, we verified this for one of these uh, candidates, the so-called uh, early dark energy, and we saw that it's actually not a problem, that adding large-scale structure data doesn't restrict the success uh, of the resolution to the Hubble tension. But what remains clear, clear is that none of these models are able to provide a, a resolution to the SA tension. So it is worth to ask if there are any physical mechanism, any model that could uh, predict a low value of SA. And in the past, I worked on a, on a scenario of two-body dark matter decay that actually uh, seems to, to explain in a very simple and nice way the, the values of SA measured by the weakness in survey. So here I'm putting the archive references if someone is interested. So yeah, now let me just jump into the conclusions. We've seen that uh, Lambda CDM provides a remarkable fit to several observations, but unfortunately we have a uh, five sigma Hubble tension and a two to three sigma SA tension. The nice thing is that this tension could be offering a interesting window to the still unknown dark sector. So thanks to a systematic study, we have uh, concluded that uh, late time solutions to the Hubble tension are the most disfavored while the solutions that change the sound horizon without involving any kind of dark radiation seem to be the most uh, promising ones. Unfortunately, none of these uh, successful, successful models is able to relieve the SA tension, but it could actually be that the resolution of this tension lie in two completely different sectors. And in particular, it seems that solving the Hubble tension might require some new background contribution, while solving the SA tension might require some new um, properties on the perturbations of dark matter. So I would like to think that uh, these tensions are just uh, giving us a hint that the dark sector is a bit uh, more complex and rich than we had imagined. And I hope that the uh, future data will be able to shed more light on this, on this issue. Thanks a lot for your attention.